We are here at General Assembly 2023, and I'm here with Dr. Ron Allen, Dr. Bob Cornwell, the authors of this wonderful book, Second Thoughts About the Second Coming. And we have three copies of this book that we're going to give away, the random drawing today. We've got people gathered around uh, for this book chat. And we want to hear all about it and what we can glean and learn from it. But before we get going, I'm going to stand up out of frame and let you guys be the stars. Uh, could you introduce yourselves to the folks who are going to be watching on YouTube and let them know who you are and what this book means to you? Uh, well, I'm Ron Allen. I grew up in a Disciples of Christ Church on the Ozark Mountains in southern Missouri. Shall I start over? I grew up in a big disciples church in Southern Missouri. I was immersed at the age of 10, went to Phillips University in blessed memory in Enid, Oklahoma, Union Theological Seminary in New York, Drew University. I married my co-minister and spouse, Linda McKernan Allen, in 1975, and we served First Christian Church as co-ministers in Grand Island, Nebraska. In 1982, I got a call out of the blue to come to CTS as a sabbatical replacement for my honored colleague, Calvin Porter, and what started out as a nine-month appointment turned into 37 years. And my name is Bob Cornwall. I'm recently, well, two years retired as pastor of Central Woodward Christian Church in Troy, Michigan. Um, I am not a lifelong disciple. I was born Episcopalian, became four square. And during my high school years, I became very interested in apocalyptic theology. Hal Lindsey and, uh, and of course, those of you, if you know uh, Larry Norman, um, you know, you just don't want to be left behind. So. Um, the t topic of our of our book is something that means uh, a lot to me. Uh, I went to Fuller Theological Seminary after going to what was then Northwest Christian College, which is now Bushnell University uh, in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, and uh, the rest is here history. Um, you want to know something about what the book means. So first of all, I'll just tell you that uh, Ron was up. It was sabbatical for me, and Ron came up to do a, um, a workshop for my congregation. And Ron, we were having breakfast, because I was not participating, but we were having breakfast. And Ron said, you know, we should write a book together. And Ron had just finished a book on, on uh, Revelation, you know, that commentary on Revelation. I said, well, what about eschatology? And he said, let's do that. So what does it mean to me? This is what my word to anybody who's uh, listening and watching, thinking about the book, is Ron and I wrote this book for two reasons. One, as me as a pastor, he as a Bible teacher in congregations, we have noticed that many of our members of our congregations have questions about eschatology. They may not use that word, but they have questions about the future, and is Jesus coming back, and what about the afterlife, and we read Left Behind, and uh, isn't that the biblical story, and no, necessarily, uh, but we also have noticed that me as a, a, as a, a pastor, and he as a t teacher, that many of our colleagues, pastoral colleagues, don't want to touch the subject with a 10-foot pole. So we knew that congregants want to have answers to these questions, and pastors are afraid to give them answers. So what we wanted to do is write a book that would help congregants and folks have a conversation and then maybe force our pa the pastors, my colleagues, uh, to take up the subject. So that's kind of my, I think Ron and I would both say that we want this as a gift to our churches and for people to have conversations about converse, in, issues of great importance to them that we in mainline churches tend to shy away from. I might add that a lot of books in the field of religion argue a point 
they try to persuade the reader of the correctness of their particular theological point of view. This book, as Bob implied, does not argue a point. It lays out options for understanding the second coming in the world of the Bible, in church history, in contemporary Christian life, and tries to help people sort through which ones are the most consistent with what they really want to believe. So it's really a conversation starter that tries to put people in the position of coming to the clarity as best they can regarding what they think God's role in the future is. I think that's an important clarification because we hear often from congregants, people in the church, people in the community outside of the church, that they feel as though they have to believe a certain way, or they think they're, to your point, Bob, isn't that the biblical interpretation as if there's one? So for people to know that there are compelling options that are valid and that they can sift through what resonates and what holds true and what doesn't, I think is a powerful thing. For people reading this book, what do you hope that uh, is the mindset they bring to engage with it? I hope they will, more than anything else, bring curiosity and openness and the willing to engage texts both in the Bible and elsewhere in their otherness and let the text sort of spark possibilities. For the most, I, I agree. I mean, what we want is for people to be engaged in conversation. It's, it's a book that can be read by, you know, individually. But I think Ron and I would agree that this is kind of the book that really is going to work best in, in group so that people can share. And because they're, I, my sense is that as people read the book, they're going to find different elements of the book compelling. So they may find the biblical stuff compelling. They might find the historical materials compelling. They might discover that, oh, because it's in there. Uh, in the historical part, that Muslims believe Jesus has something to do with the second coming. They believe in the second coming. My guess is that most people don't realize that. Uh, so they might find different elements of the story that they find compelling, and by sharing together, they're going to be able to learn more about what are the options and the possibilities. They may not all come to the same point, of you, but they may find that they they have a, a richer understanding of these issues that that are there in front of them. So at this point, I'm going to come to some of the audience that we have standing around for this chat and give them a chance to ask the question. We're obviously in a in general assembly in the midst of this airplane hangar that is a convention center, and so we've got these microphones. I will come hold the microphone for you if you could say your name. Um, and where you're from, and ask your question uh, nice and loud. I'll make sure uh, I can restate it with my coach voice if need be, and we'll give you guys a chance to answer. I wonder if we could do a five or six sentence outline of what's in the book, just so people have a sense of that. Absolutely. And I think likely, Dr. Allen, as one of your students, this is a good moment for me to remember I have much to learn from you. That's probably a good idea to do before we ask them to ask questions. <laughs> so please, go ahead. It's a matter of exegesis before preaching. Uh, why don't we, we'll take the chapters that we wrote. I did the first section, which is on the Bible, concentrating first of all on not the second coming, but God's ultimate purposes, different viewpoints on that, in the Torah, Prophets, and Writings. And then the two main streams of thought on God's ultimate purposes, specifically related to the second coming in the Gospels and Letters. And then Bob picks up for a little while. So, so I wrote two chapters on the history. So the first chap, chapter, historical chapter takes it from basically the second century up to the Reformation. Uh, and the second chapter is from the, basically from the Reformation uh, 
basically to the beginning of the 19th century. What, it, what we tried to, I tried to do with that portion is to help people know that on these questions, there have been a lot of different viewpoints developed over time, and that what we have today is, uh, is an inheritance as, as the church in its various forms interpreted those texts that Ron uh, spoke to. Um, and uh, it's a length, those are lengthy chapters. And uh, uh, two of our readers told us, uh, as we wrote them, they were tough going at points, but I think they're going to be very useful if you're willing to plow through them, as history is that way. So let me get this straight. Uh, history chapters are long. Big surprise there. Yeah. Uh, but compelling. Yes. From the perspective of a historian. Correct. And as a history nerd, I'm, I have to say I'm excited. So I'm glad you left that in there. Um, are there any are there any conclusions that the book comes to? Well, it actually covers some more ground before we get to the conclusions. Um, I did a chapter on the three great millennialisms, which sort of bridges history and is also contemporary. Premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism. And then we have a chapter on contemporary appropriations in different theological families, like uh, demythologizing. <laughs> Brent Hayworth was in the room where I first heard the name of the word demythologizing. Uh, liberation approaches to God's ultimate purposes and process approaches. And Moltmann. Oh, yes, and Moltmann, the theology of hope. I would say that for a historian, he has a very accessible style of writing. <laughs> and, and I have to tell you this, and as far as those millennial chapters, uh, we had uh, a lot of debate. Because I had to convince Ron that uh, pre dispensationalism and premillennialism are not always synonymous. So he, he finally gave in uh, to, my, uh, to, to my push. Um, but um, the post-millennial, I'll have to say the post-millennial one should be of interest simply because of the political implications today in terms of Christian nationalism. As we talked about yesterday, there are uh, some dr things that are drawn from post-millennialism. If nothing else from the book, that chapter is probably going to have some implications for contemporary conversation. And then we also have a chapter that moves from the second coming and God's ultimate purposes to visions of the afterlife. What, what might happen in the beyond according to voices in church history. We wanted to do a whole book on just that, but Westminster John Knox thought it could be nested in this larger project. And then Bob did a study guide. So it's a study guide for at least, at minimum, six weeks. Though the biblical uh, sections probably could be divided into two sections, and Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, if you wanted. Uh, so the, it could be anywhere from six to eight chapter uh, weeks sessions. Uh, but... And when we, I wrote the, in a way that there's lots of questions, you don't have to use them all, but there's enough there to, for whoever's leading them to create really good conversation. So this is also a resource that congregations and communities could use to engage with one another in community. That would be our goal. And then Ron created uh, two resources for preachers but those are on the Westminster John Knox website. Uh, the reason being is when we were, Ron was going to create these and said, well, we add them to the book. But Westminster John Knox said, if we got preaching materials in a book, then the lay people will say, I think it's a preacher's book. And so they want to sell it to non-preachers. But then we have some resources for the preachers as well. One of the preaching helps deals second coming themes, deals with second coming themes in the lectionary. And make no mistake about it, the lectionary is an apocalyptically oriented way of reading the Bible. 
And the other has to do with sermon series that you can develop in different ways on the second coming, different ideas about the second coming and so forth. Very practical. And those are available through the Westminster John Knox website? Yes. And they're free. Just the PDFs you can download. So they are downloadable PDFs free on the website. So I'm going to ask one more question before okay. turning it over to the audience. Um, and obviously with, with taking this book on the road now, you're having conversations and you mentioned uh, the, the referendum that was discussed condemning Christian nationalism. I think for some people, they think second coming and they either think far in the future or they think far in the past about when this was discussed or when biblical texts were written. What do you see as the main um, points of engagement that people can use as anchors for why this matters in our current context? Well, the first thing is to realize the structure of post-millennial thinking, which incidentally is the eschatology of Alexander Campbell. So it's in our DNA, even if we don't claim it or talk about it in these terms. In simplified form, it's the idea that the church needs to get busy and clean up the world and establish a, a miniature version of the values and practices of the reign of God, at the end of which, when we've done our job and things are set up, Jesus will come back and complete it and put it in place for eternity. Christian nationalism, even when it doesn't operate under the language of post-millennialism, understands its job to be to establish Christian values as authoritative in every arena of human life. The individual, the home, the church, and the social order. So you hear them talk about a Christian nation. What they mean is establishing their version of Christianity as the legal premise on which our whole society operates. And for them, it is a holy cause. It's not just a political option. Whatever complications it may have in the way of guaranteeing social power, benefiting certain groups, at root there is this deeply theological conviction. And until we address that, it's here to stay in one form or another. So, Ron, you, you mentioned the, the post-millennial Christian nationalism connection that, here. But the, the last two words of the subtitle speak of Christian hope. And that is, in my mind, our ultimate goal is that people look, can use this to think about the future, what the scripture and theology says about the future, and ultimately have a sense of hope. Whether we believe that Jesus is going to come back literally or not, uh, and we don't necessarily take a position on that in the book, we leave that open. Whatever your position is in all of this, our hope is that it, the conversation will enable people to think about the future in a way that will bring them hope and that they can contribute to the betterment of the world. So sometimes apocalyptic theology is is seen as, you know, it's like, well, there's going to be disaster and and Armageddon and and uh, you know maybe it's going to be around the corner, so we don't even have to worry about the world. But that's not necessarily the case. And so if we can have a hopeful view of the future, we help create that. We talk at Christian Theological Seminary about God's transforming of the world and working towards this liberative, restorative justice, this wholeness for all that, that is happening right now. We had Dr. Bill Kincaid here for a book chat yesterday, and he interviewed leaders during COVID. And one thing he mentioned in a takeaway for his book was, despite this horrible pandemic going on, there was such a sense of hope with those he interviewed for pulling out how we were growing and transforming. Yeah. 
And so that's something that I think is timeless, but is particularly of import today. Right. I'm going to now turn to our audience. And if you have a question, if you can give me a little hand wave, I'll come over and you'll want to hold this right towards your mouth. Say who you are, ask your question, and I'll restate it if need be. Hi, my name is Debbie Harmon. Um, and in speaking of eschatology and apocalyptic thought, it often, at least in congregants I've known, evokes fear. Is there lines of thinking in the book that move them from fear to the hope that you speak of? So I'll say the first thing. So there's a question of the people's sense of fear when they think about apocalyptic or eschatology. So one of the things I think is information is helpful to, re to relieve fear. So if you begin to understand the options and the possibilities and know that, yeah, there are views that would, you could take as fearful, but that there are other options that are not, I think the conversation, by actually having the conversation, will re, uh, relieve a lot of the fear. Because I think a lot of the fear is rooted in the sense that people have not had that opportunity to have conversation. And the fact that, as we, I said, a lot of pastors don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I, I think, finally, the antidote to fear is having an adequate understanding of God. And we try in this book to point out how specific biblical and historical movements portrayed God in relationship to what they understand God's ultimate purposes to be. And we believe that ultimately God's purposes are redemptive, renewing, transforming. And it's a question of how you think God will operate and how to be responsive to the divine initiatives. And, and I think along with this goes naming aspects of the popular presentation of apocalyptic end time thinking that is all over the airwaves, visually and auditory, all over the inexpensive, easy to understand literature that you can pick up at the grocery store. Understand that, try to help people understand that that's a caricature. It does have certain roots in history, but they've been blown out of proportion. And learning to frame these things historically and theologically, can go a long way toward transforming one's attitude toward these issues. But there are no magic bullets here. We have another question. Okay, we've got a quiet crowd. I'll jump in with another question. Dr. Allen can attest. I am not one to hesitate to ask questions. Uh, I can testify to that. I can testify to that. We, uh, we had alumni stop by the booth yesterday who may or may not be in the audience and uh, shared some recollections of having had you in class and some of these things that have stood true. One of which was, what's your sermon in a sentence? So this idea of helping students be able to articulate their big idea. So I'm going to I'm going to turn one back on you, Dr. Allen and say what is this book to you in a sentence? I would say I'm a process theologian so this will not surprise you. God is ever and always relentlessly inviting us to possibilities for inclusive well-being for all. Bob said, I might shift the focus just a little. Bob said earlier, we don't make a recommendation in this book for how to approach these things, but we do confess our own points of view. And I have just articulated mine. This often flummoxes lay people initially, but I can lay out the apocalyptic viewpoint with great clarity. But then there comes this moment in the classroom when I have to admit, I don't believe it. That's not my theology. This is where a combination of demythologizing and process come into view 
to get to the point that I just articulated as a sermon and a sentence. Perfect. Now, Bob, as a historian, uh, I'm going to give you three sentences. Okay. <laughs> so, number one, I didn't take Ron for preaching, so I have no idea how to say do a sermon in a sentence. Um, but three sentences, maybe. So, one thing I, I can say from my own perspective is that historically, the church in all of its f existences and forms has had a sense of the future. They don't always agree, but there's always the sense that, that, that we're moving forward. So that's number one, I think, is that the message is we're moving forward. Number two um, is that, well, there's always a sense of, there always is a, a dark perspective available, even an apocalyptic one, that there always is also another perspective, a, a, a possibility of good things happening. And then the third thing is, I'll just say from my own perspective is, I'm not a process theologian, as Ron knows, uh, but I, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, Moltmann, uh, but Moltmann is an interesting figure in the sense that he does have an apocalyptic sense of theology, but not in a negative way, but that God's revelation, God's hope will be revealed in time, and that will help us move forward. And so sometimes I, I like uh, Moltmann's idea that God is out in front of us, beckoning us uh, into the future. Which I know Ron thinks is processed, but I don't. I don't. Uh, I did not accept Whitehead into my heart as my Lord and Savior. So <laughs> this is a joke that I, Ron and I have. But anyway, that's kind of my. I guess my three sentences. Bob saying is that he would rather face his base his faith on the God of the Bible than an English philosopher. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Allen, Dr. Cornwall, thank you so much for taking time to sit down and chat with us. We're going to go ahead and end the recording here in a moment and allow you to mingle and mix with these folks as well as do the book giveaway. Uh, but before we do, I want to give you both a chance to share any, any closing thoughts that you want to with the audience. I think that the thing we worked the hardest at was to show respect for all the viewpoints in the book so that if a dominion theology uh, post-millennialist picked up the book, he or she would recognize himself or herself in the way they want to be understood and not in caricature. Uh, this sometimes required great discipline on our parts, but I do think we achieved that goal. And my greatest hope is that people will come away from the group, from the book, and from conversation about the book with a greater sense of confidence that there's something going on here that we might call a more with which we can identify and with which we can participate that will eventuate in, in a better, more inclusive world for human beings, nature, and things beyond. So I'll just kind of reiterate kind of what I've, I've said, and that's just the sense that my, we have this sense of hope that it will be utilized in a way that will benefit the church. That's who we wrote it for. Uh, and that it will alleviate some fear by having the conversation. It will help people realize that there's more than one viewpoint. And as Ron said, we tried our very best um, to be fair. And that might frustrate some readers because they might feel like we bend over backwards uh, to be fair to positions that maybe they find problematic. And we might find them problematic too, but we felt like it was better to err on the side of being fair, what we thought was being fair, um, than to, to be overly critical and then cut off conversation. I think that's 
something that we can all learn from as we are in ministry, in leadership, in community, particularly in a divisive climate, is really listening to understand how a person wants to be understood rather than asserting our interpretation of our understanding of who they are is a great starting point to connect and have conversation. It sounds like that's your real goal is that this book will produce that kind of conversation. Yes. And I look forward to seeing the work that it does, the impact it has. And again, thank you very much. And we thank you for tuning in. We're going to pause to let you guys interact.